what I'd like to do is, is, is really thank you. Um, so now that we've kind of completed um, meeting and educating our elected officials, shaking hands with some of the top leaders in our country, enjoying the camaraderie and a great evening yesterday, being entertained by the world famous Capitol Steps, celebrating wonderful achievements by our award winners, Chiropractor of the Year, Humanitarian of the Year, Delegate of the Year. It is now time to get down to business. I can tell you this, it's been quite a remarkable few months. Regardless of what anyone told me, Dr. McMichael, Dr. Manso's not in here, Dr. Wills, I could not have imagined the time and workload that this job requires. Yet I also could not imagine doing anything different. And I'm honored to continue on. I also know that Mike is honored to continue on, and Tony is honored to continue on, and Dr. Hurd, and Dr. Vaughn, and Dr. Myers, all of our elected officials are all ready to give 110%. And my, our staff, my goodness, I can call the ACA headquarters at 9.30 at night, and this man will pick up the phone, and we'll be talking for another half an hour. I didn't say he's an idiot. You said he's an idiot. Yeah. Uh, I get emails from Janet, our DEVP, at 5 a.m. Now the thing is, what's she doing up writing them? What am I doing up reading them? But she's there every, almost every morning we're seeing those. And our vice presidents, not five days a week am I getting emails from them, but seven days a week are we getting emails from them working on our behalf. I could go on about the many staff and volunteers, but suffice it to say, your leadership team and your staff are committed to this association and this profession. It is not overstated when you hear about how much time is lost with family and friends, and even how much we give up in our income. So that begs the question, why? Why do I do this? Why do all of us do this? The answer I keep coming back to it's probably similar to everyone in the room today. My job in the ACA allows me to make a difference in people's lives. And perhaps that is one of life's greatest callings. When we all took our oaths upon graduation, in some cases quite a few years ago, there was a common theme. The theme was the patient. Provide the best patient care. Treat the patient as you would like to be treated yourself. Provide an opportunity to educate people in healthy living, healthy lifestyles. It was before the term was created, but now we call it patient-centered care. Although nowadays, too often, in the media, we hear about the opposite. Of course, not only from our profession, but others as well. Being found guilty of insurance fraud, over-treatment, personal injury scams, sexual misconduct, drug abuse. Heck, I was once even asked to testify in Connecticut when a doctor of chiropractic punched out a guy twice his age and half his size over a parking spot. Yet, even those sound bites, even with those sound bites, I'm reminded as I look in our hall today and in the similar ones I see when I travel around the country, that our profession, the vast majority of our profession, are great people and only want to help their patients using clinically effective, cost effective, naturally based approaches to healthcare called chiropractic. To go back to my question earlier, I asked, why do I do this again? And here's my second answer. Every day in my office, I see patients get well under my care. Even after they've seen multiple specialists, and many have tried a myriad of drugs, and in some cases multiple surgeries. So here's the rub. I know what I do works, and it works well. My patients know what I do works, and works well. They know that I help them stay off of prescription pharmaceuticals. In my office, and in my community, I believe I've got some pretty good cultural authority. And I'm sure you do, in yours. In fact, a recent article showed that there are 822 studies on manipulation alone, most of course showing the effectiveness, the safety, and high patient satisfaction. 
So how do we explain this apparent disconnect between the results we see in our offices with the ample evidence we have and how this profession is viewed and treated by others? Why, I ask, is there such discrimination against our profession? Why are the two letters after our name so toxic to some in other healthcare fields that they become almost irrationally venomous? Well, I have lived through discrimination like this for over 30 years. In my office, in locker rooms, on the sports field as a team doctor, and yes, even in my pocketbook. So the second reason I give for taking on the role of leading the largest chiropractic association in this world is the famous 1976 quote from the movie Network, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. Listen to this letter from a member. I've got a couple letters I just need you to hear. I'm a fairly recent graduate from the Palmer School and new in practice, so please forgive the next question, which may seem elementary. I'm in network with XYZ Healthcare and get compensated $45 max per visit. Despite dedicating countless hours of my time to their beneficiaries, one patient had a true cervical radiculopathy. It was my, one of my first patients. Using a variety of techniques and dedicating over an hour to each appointment, I saw his condition to resolution. I was paid a whopping $360. He was scheduled for surgery. How much did that insurance company save? What lesson did I learn? Well, I'll tell you, never again. Never again. But I have no choice, do I? This is how the networks treat us. Another letter. The ACA needed to sue Medicare years ago for professional racism and discrimination against our patients. Not us. Also, the lack of safety in not allowing x-rays and a decent exam to the oldest and most at-risk population. Instead, the ACA has been spinning their wheels on resource and resources on keeping us as the only one who can diagnose and treat a subluxation. After 40 years in Medicare, we are still fighting about subluxation versus the real issue. What a waste of time, money, and talent. Third and last letter. I wish I could support the people who support us when asked by PAC, but with chiropractic being what it is in New York State, I cannot afford to support anyone else, as I am not supporting myself and my family with the current situation in chiropractic. We have effectively lost workers' compensation and no fault in New York, $50 copays for chiropractic, and a $0 copay for those manipulating doctors of physical therapy who drive away patients from chiropractic offices. As a professional with four years of college, a bachelor degree, a doctoral degree, the first chief of chiropractic in any hospital in New York State, I never thought I would have to say, thank God my wife works. So you may wonder, why am I reading these that are kind of depressing on a day we're supposed to work and work hard? Well, you know, it's to remind us how our members are feeling, how frustrated and powerless they feel, we, why maybe some of them are not actually joining the ACA. But rather than be depressed about it, I think this should actually inspire us to do more, to get others to do more, a call to action, so to speak. This is what being a servant leader is about, to help others as a team. As Becky Halstead said, our humanitarian of the year, to many of us, many times, team, together, each achieves more. Yes, doctors, yes, staff, we have our work cut out for us. We know our members deserve better. We all deserve better. Making a profit as a small business is nothing to be ashamed of. We deserve it, and our patients deserve access to our care. This discrimination, it must end. The patient must come first. The playing field must be leveled. If not here, if, I'm sorry, if not, here is an example of what they can expect. Hawaiian Gardens, California. Consuelo Solero, a middle-aged tomato cannery employee traveled three hours from her home in San Joaquin Valley to have spine surgery for an injury from um, tumbling off a ladder. 
Her destination, Tri-City Regional Medical Center, a hospital that has developed a thriving business doing back surgery on workers' compensation patients. It's built up this business fairly rapidly. For an operation known as spinal fusion, which joins two or more vertebrae, the small hospital billed workers' compensation insurers $65 million in 2010, up from $3 million a couple of years earlier. So here we are, kind of in a conflict of sorts, I would say. One, only the ACA can help bring this profession through. We have the evidence. Check out this new article from just last week. Cerebral metabolic changes seen in men after chiropractic spinal manipulation. Changes in glucose levels, thus changing pain modulation. Pretty interesting. And patient satisfaction? Off the charts. We have the schooling. We are cost effective. We are qualified, we are safe, we are accessible. We have many of the answers to help resolve the healthcare crisis in our country. So how do we go from knowing we have a solution to having the rest of the country know we have a solution? Never before have we had an opportunity like today. Healthcare reform is an open book with the printed word not yet on it. New definitions, new payment schemes, new delivery models. Our job, our job in this room, everyone in this room, is to take on this challenge and let every regulator, every state legislator, federal and federal and state level know what the evidence shows. We have created documents for you on virtually every aspect of healthcare reform that affects us. Cost effectiveness, evidence, case for full inclusion, patient-centered medical home, ACOs, insurance exchanges. Our staff, the task force, your leadership, you, have put together the ammunition to blow a hole in the old historic bias and discrimination we have faced for 100 years. It is time for us to deliver we have a survey going out talking about insurance abuses. We have information that everyone needs and all the resources you could want. Thomas Jefferson said, success is the contribution an individual makes to help his fellow human beings. I believe individually we've all been successful. But now it is about not the individual, but being successful with every citizen in the United States of America. This weekend, you will hear from many speakers. We will have lively discussion and debate. We will spend money and utilize our resources. We will decide to make a difference in our patients' lives, and we will decide, or we will decide to let others do it for us. You are the group of people that will mold this profession and what it will look like in the future. Please pay attention to our educators on the panel as they discuss primary care. Listen to our researchers as they discuss the current state of research in our profession. Listen to our partner organizations later. Enlighten us on how they are helping improve cultural authority. Enjoy the examples of people like Ted Carrick and Spencer Barron when they speak. Then in the end, after we soak it all in, answer this question. This is the question. Do we move forward or do we bury our heads in the past? I ask each of you to make an appointment to speak with your state association board. Get them to understand this is the time for action. After this weekend, you will know more than anyone in your state on how to move this profession forward. You will have the resources to lead. And the mere fact that you are here today shows me that you are ready, willing, and able to do so. We cannot wait for someone else to step up. It is our time to act. Margaret Mead once said, never doubt a small group of thoughtful people changed the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that has. Thank you.